Charlotte's Web by E. B. White Chapter 17 Uncle When they pulled into the fairgrounds, they could hear music and see the Ferris wheel turning in the sky. They could smell the dust of the racetrack where the sprinkling cart had moistened it. And they could smell hamburgers frying and see balloons aloft. They could hear sheep blatting in their pens. An enormous voice over the loudspeaker said, Attention, please. Will the owner of a Pontiac car, license number H2439, please move your car away from the fireworks shed? Can I have some money? asked Fern. Can I too? asked Avery. I'm going to win a doll by spinning a wheel, and it will stop at the right number, said Fern. I'm going to steer a jet plane and make it bump into another one. Can I have a balloon? asked Fern. Can I have a frozen custard and a cheeseburger and some raspberry soda pop? asked Avery. You children be quiet till we get the pig unloaded, said Mrs. Arable. Let's let the children go off by themselves, suggested Mr. Arable. The fair only comes once a year. Mr. Arable gave Fern two quarters and two dimes. He gave Avery five dimes and four nickels. Now, run along, he said, and remember, the money has to last all day. Don't spend it all in the first few minutes. And be back here at the truck at noontime so we can all have lunch together. And don't eat a lot of stuff that's going to make you sick to your stomachs. And if you go in those swings said Mrs. Arable. You hang on tight. You hang on very tight. Hear me? And don't get lost, said Mrs. Zuckerman. And don't get dirty. Don't get overheated, said their mother. Watch out for pickpockets, cautioned their father. And don't cross the racetrack when the horses are coming, cried Mrs. Zuckerman. The children grabbed each other by the hand and danced off in the direction of the merry-go-round toward the wonderful music and the wonderful adventure and the wonderful excitement into the wonderful midway where they were where there would be no parents to guard them and guide them and where they could be happy and free and do as they pleased mrs arable stood quietly and watched them go then she sighed then she blew her nose do you really think it's all right she asked. Well, they've got to grow up sometime, said Mr. Arable, and a fair is a good place to start, I guess. While Wilbur was being unloaded and taken out of his crate and into his new pig pen, crowds gathered to watch. They stared at the sign, Zuckerman's Famous Pig. Wilbur stared back and tried to look extra good. He was pleased with his new home. The pen was grassy, and it was shaded from the sun by a shed roof. Charlotte, watching her chance, scrambled out of the crate and climbed a post to the underside of the roof. Nobody noticed her. Templeton, not wishing to come out in broad daylight, stayed quietly under the straw at the bottom of the crate. Mr. Zuckerman poured some skim milk into Wilbur's trough, pitched clean straw into his pen, and then... He and Mrs. Zuckerman and the Arables walked away toward the cattle barn to look at purebred cows and to see the sights. Mr. Zuckerman particularly wanted to look at tractors. Mrs. Zuckerman wanted to see a deep freeze. Lurvy wanted wandered off by himself, hoping to meet friends and have some fun on the midway. As soon as the people were gone, Charlotte spoke to Wilbur. It's a good thing you can't see what I see, she said. What do you see? asked Wilbur. There's a pig in the next pen, and he's enormous. I'm afraid he's much bigger than you are. Maybe he's older than I am, and has had more time to grow, suggested Wilbur. Tears began to come to his eyes. I'll drop down and have a closer look, Charlotte said. Then she crawled along a beam till she was directly over the next pen. She let herself down on a drag line 
until she hung in the air just in front of the big pig's snout. May I have your name? she asked politely. The pig stared at her. No name, he said in a big, hearty voice. Just call me Uncle. Very well, Uncle, replied Charlotte. What is the date of your birth? Are you a spring pig? Sure, I'm a spring pig, replied Uncle. What did you think I was? A spring chicken? Ha ha, that's a good one, eh, sister? Mildly funny, said Charlotte. I've heard funnier ones, though. Glad to have met you, and now I must be going. She ascended slowly and returned to Wilbur's pen. He claims he's a spring pig, reported Charlotte, and perhaps he is. One thing is certain, he has a most unattractive personality. He is too familiar, too noisy, and he cracks weak jokes. Also, he's not anywhere near as clean as you are, nor as pleasant. I took quite a dislike to him in our brief interview. He's going to be a hard pig to beat, though, Wilbur, on account of his size and weight. But with me helping you, it can be done. When are you going to spin a web? asked Wilbur. This afternoon, late, if I'm not too tired, said Charlotte. The least thing tires me these days. I don't seem to have the energy I once had. My age, I guess. Wilbur looked at his friend. She looked rather swollen, and she seemed listless. I'm awfully sorry to hear that you're feeling poorly, Charlotte, he said. Perhaps if you spin a web and catch a couple of flies, you'll feel better. Perhaps, she said wearily, but I feel like the end of a long day. Clinging upside down to the ceiling, she settled down for a nap, leaving Wilbur very much worried. All morning, people wandered past Wilbur's pen. Dozens and dozens of strangers stopped to stare at him and to admire his silky white coat, his curly tail, his kind and radiant expression. Then they would move on to the next pen where the bigger pig lay. Wilbur heard several people make favorable remarks about Uncle's great size. He couldn't help overhearing these remarks, and he couldn't help worrying. And now, with Charlotte not feeling well, he thought, Oh dear. All morning, Templeton slept quietly under the straw. The day grew fiercely hot. At noon, the Zuckermans and the Arables returned to the pig pen. Then, a few minutes later, Fern and Avery showed up. Fern had a monkey doll in her arms and was eating Cracker Jack. Avery had a balloon tied to his ear and was chewing a candied apple. The children were hot and dirty. Isn't it hot? said Mrs. Zuckerman. It's terribly hot said Mrs. Arable, fanning herself with an advertisement of a deep freeze. One by one, they climbed into the truck and opened lunchboxes. The sun beat down on everything. Nobody seemed hungry. When are the judges going to decide about Wilbur? asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Not till tomorrow, said Mr. Zuckerman. Lurvy appeared, carrying an Indian blanket that he had won. That's just what we need, said Avery, a blanket. Of course it is, replied Lurvy, and he spread the blanket across the sideboards of the truck so that it was a, like a little tent. The children sat in the shade under the blanket and felt better. After lunch, they stretched out and fell asleep. Chapter 18 The Cool of the Evening in the cool of the evening, when shadows darkened the fairgrounds, Templeton crept from the crate and looked around. Wilbur lay asleep in the straw. Charlotte was building a web. Templeton's keen nose detected many fine smells in the air. The rat was hungry and thirsty. He decided to go exploring. Without saying anything to anybody, he started off. Bring me back a word, Charlotte called after him. I shall be writing tonight for the last time. 
The rat mumbled something to himself and disappeared into the shadows. He did not like being treated like a messenger boy. After the heat of the day, the evening came as a welcomed relief to all. The Ferris wheel was lighted now. It went round and round in the sky and seemed twice as high as by day. There were lights on the midway, and you could hear the crackle of the gambling machines and the music of the merry-go-round and the voice of the man in the Beano booth calling numbers. The children felt refreshed after their nap. Fern met her friend Henry Fussy, and he invited her to ride with him in the Ferris wheel. He even bought a ticket for her, so it didn't cost her anything. When Mrs. Arable happened to look up into the starry sky and saw her little daughter sitting with Henry Fussy and going higher and higher into the air and saw how happy Fern looked, she just shook her head. My, my, she said. Henry Fussy, think of that. Templeton kept out of sight. In the tall grass behind the cattle barn, he found a folded newspaper. Inside it were leftovers from somebody's lunch. He'd a deviled ham sandwich, a piece of Swiss cheese, part of a hard-boiled egg, and the core of a wormy apple. The rat crawled in and ate everything. Then he tore a word out of the paper, rolled it up, and started back to Wilbur's pen. Charlotte had her web almost finished when Templeton returned carrying the newspaper clipping. She had left a space in the middle of the web. At this hour, no people were around the pig pen, so the rat and the spider and the pig were by themselves. I hope you brought a good one, Charlotte said. It is the last word I shall ever write. Here, said Templeton, unrolling the paper. What does it say? asked Charlotte. You'll have to read it for me. It says humble, replied the rat. Humble, said Charlotte. Humble has two meanings. It means not proud, and it means near the ground. That's Wilbur all over. He's not proud, and he's near the ground. Well, I hope you're satisfied, sneered the rat. I'm not going to spend all my time fetching and carrying. I came to this fair to enjoy myself not to deliver papers. You've been very helpful, Charlotte said. Run along if you want to see more of the fair. The rat grinned. I'm going to make a night of it, he said. The old sheep was right. This fair is a rat's paradise. What eating and what drinking and everywhere good hiding and good hunting. Bye-bye, my humble Wilbur. Fare thee well, Charlotte, you old schemer. This will be a night to remember in a rat's life. He vanished into the shadows. Charlotte went back for it to her work. It was quite dark now. In the distance, fireworks began going off. Rockets, scattering fire, fiery balls in the sky. By the time the Arables and the Zuckermans and the Lurvy returned from the grandstand, Charlotte had finished her web. The word humble was woven neatly in the center. Nobody noticed it in the darkness. Everyone was tired and happy. Fern and Avery climbed into the truck and lay down. They pulled the Indian blanket over them. Lurvy gave Wilbur a forkful of fresh straw. Mr. Arable patted him. Time for us to go home, he said to the pig. See you tomorrow. The grown-ups climbed slowly into the truck, and Wilbur heard the engine start. Then he heard the truck moving away in low speed. He would have felt lonely and homesick had Charlotte not been with him. He never felt lonely when she was near. In the distance, he could still hear the music of the merry-go-round. As he was dropping off to sleep, he spoke to Charlotte. Sing me that song again, about the dong in the dark, he begged. Not tonight, she said in a low voice. I'm too tired. Her voice didn't seem to come from her web. Where are you? asked Wilbur. I can't see you. Are you on your web? I'm back here, she answered, up in this back corner. Why aren't you on your web? asked Wilbur. You almost never leave your web. I've left it tonight, 
she said. Wilbur closed his eyes. Charlotte, he said after a while, do you really think Zuckerman will let me live and not kill me when the cold weather comes? Do you really think so? Of course, said Charlotte. You are a famous pig, and you are a good pig. Tomorrow you will probably win a prize. The whole world will hear about you. Zuckerman will be proud and happy to own such a pig. You have nothing to fear, Wilbur, nothing to worry about. Maybe you'll live forever. Who knows? And now, go to sleep. For a while, there was no sound. Then Wilbur's voice. What are you doing up there, Charlotte? Oh, making something, she said. Making something as usual. Is it something for me? asked Wilbur. No, said Charlotte. It's something for me, for a change. Please tell me what it is begged Wilbur. I'll tell you in the morning, she said. When the first light comes into the sky, and the sparrows stir, and the cows rattle their chains, when the rooster crows and the stars fade, when early cars whisper along the highway, you look up here, and I'll show you something. I will show you my masterpiece. Before she finished the sentence, Wilbur was asleep. She could tell by the sound of his breathing that he was sleeping peacefully, deep in the straw. Miles away at the Arable's house, the men sat around the kitchen table eating a dish of canned peaches and talking over the events of the day. Upstairs, Avery was already in bed and asleep. Mrs. Arable was tucking Fern into bed. Did you have a good time at the fair? she asked as she kissed her daughter. Fern nodded. I had the best time I have ever had anywhere or any time in all of my whole life. Well, said Mrs. Arable, isn't that nice? Chapter 19 The Egg Sack Next morning when the first light came into the sky and the sparrows stirred in the trees, when the cows rattled their chains and the rooster crowed, and the early automobiles went whispering along the road, Wilbur awoke and looked for Charlotte. He saw her up overhead in a corner near the back of his pen. She was very quiet. Her eight legs were spread wide. She seemed to have shrunk during the night. Next to her, attached to the ceiling, Wilbur saw a curious object. It was a sort of sack or cocoon. It was peach-colored and looked as though it were made of cotton candy. Are you awake, Charlotte? he said softly. Yes, came the answer. What is that nifty little thing? Did you make it? I did indeed, replied Charlotte in a weak voice. Is it a plaything? Plaything? I should say not. It is my egg sac, my magnum opus. I don't know what a magnum opus is, said Wilbur. That's Latin, explained Charlotte. It means great work. This egg sack is my great work, the finest thing I have ever made. What's inside it? asked Wilbur. Eggs? Five hundred and fourteen of them, she replied. Five hundred and fourteen? said Wilbur. You're kidding. No, I'm not. I counted them. I got started counting, so I kept on, just to keep my mind occupied. It's a perfectly beautiful egg sack, said Wilbur, feeling as happy as though he had constructed it himself. Yes, it is pretty, replied Charlotte, patting the sack with her two front legs. Anyway, I can guarantee that it is, str so it is strong. It's made out of the toughest material I have. It is also waterproof. The eggs are inside and will be warm and dry. Charlotte, said Wilbur dreamily, are you really going to have 514 children? If nothing happens, yes, she said. Of course. They won't show up till next spring. Wilbur noticed that Charlotte's voice sounded sad. What makes you sound so downhearted? 
I should think you'd be terribly happy about this. Oh, don't pay any attention to me, said Charlotte. I just don't have much pep anymore. I guess I feel sad because I won't ever see my children. What do you mean you won't see your children? Of course you will. We'll all see them. It's going to be simply wonderful next spring in the barn cellar with 514 baby spiders running around all over the place. And the geese will have a new set of gosling. And the sheep will have their new lambs. Maybe, said Charlotte quietly. However, I have a feeling I'm not going to see the results of last night's efforts. I don't feel good at all. I think I'm languishing, to tell you the truth. Wilbur didn't understand the word languish, and he hated to bother Charlotte by asking her to explain, but he was so worried he felt he had to ask, What does languishing mean? It means I'm slowing up, feeling my age. I'm not young anymore, Wilbur, but I don't want you to worry about me. This is your big day today. Look at my web. Doesn't it show up well with the dew on it? Charlotte's web never looked more beautiful than it looked this morning. Each strand held dozens of bright drops of early morning dew. The light from the east struck it and made it all plain and clear. It was a perfect piece of designing and building. In another hour or two, a steady stream of people would pass by, admiring it and reading it and looking at Wilbur and marveling at the miracle. As Wilbur was studying the web, a pair of whiskers and a sharp face appeared. Slowly, Templeton dragged himself across the pen and threw himself down in a corner. I'm back, he said in a husky voice. What a night! The rat was swollen to twice his normal size. His stomach was as big around as a jelly jar. What a night, he repeated hoarsely. What feasting and carousing! A real gorge! I must have eaten the remains of thirty lunches. Never have I seen such leavings, and everything well ripened and seasoned with the passage of time and the heat of the day. Oh, it was rich, my friends, rich! You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Charlotte in disgust. It would serve you right if you had an acute attack of indigestion. Don't worry about my stomach, snarled Templeton. It can handle anything. And by the way, I've got some bad news. As I came past the pig next door, the one that calls himself Uncle, I noticed a blue tag on the front of his pen. That means he has won first prize. I guess you're licked, Wilbur. You might as well relax. Nobody's going to hang any medal on you. Furthermore, I wouldn't be surprised if Zuckerman changes his mind about you. Wait till he gets hankering for some fresh pork and smoked ham and crisp bacon. He'll take the knife to you, my boy. Be still, Templeton, said Charlotte. You're too stuffed and bloated to know what you're saying. Don't pay any attention to him, Wilbur. Wilbur tried not to think about what the rat had just said. He decided to change the subject. Templeton? said Wilbur. If you weren't so dopey, you would have noticed that Charlotte has made an egg sac. She is going to become a mother. For your information, there are 514 eggs in that peachy little sack. Is this true? asked the rat, eyeing the sack suspiciously. Yes, it's true, sighed Charlotte. Congratulations, murmured Templeton. This has been a night. He closed his eyes, pulled some straw over himself, and dropped off into, into a deep sleep. Wilbur and Charlotte were glad to be rid of him for a while. At nine o'clock, Mr. Arable's truck rolled into the fairgrounds and climbed to a, came to a stop at Wilbur's pen. Everybody climbed out. Look, cried Fern, look at Charlotte's web. Look what it says. The grown-ups and the children joined hands and stood there, studying the new sign. Humble, said Mr. Zuckerman. Now isn't that just the word for Wilbur? 
Everyone rejoiced to find that the miracle of the web had been repeated. Wilbur gazed up lovingly into their faces. He looked very humble and very grateful. Fern winked at Charlotte. Lurvy soon got busy. He poured a bucket of warm slops into the trough, and while Wilbur ate his breakfast, Lurvy scratched him gently with a smooth stick. Wait a minute, cried Avery. Look at this. He pointed to the blue tag on, uncle, on the uncle's pen. This pig has won first prize already. The Zuckermans and the Arables stared at the tag. Mrs. Zuckerman began to cry. Nobody said a word. They just stared at the tag. Then they stared at Uncle. Then they stared at the tag again. Lurvy took out an enormous handkerchief and blew his nose very loud. So loud, in fact, that the noise was heard by stable boys over at the horse barn. Can I have some money? asked Fern. I want to go out on the midway. You stay right where you are said her mother. Tears came to Fern's eyes. What's everybody crying about? asked Mr. Zuckerman. Let's get busy. Edith, bring the buttermilk. Mrs. Zuckerman wiped her eyes with her handkerchief. She went to the truck and came back with a gallon jar of buttermilk. Bath time, said Zuckerman cheerfully. He and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery climbed into Wilbur's pen Avery slowly poured buttermilk on Wilbur's head and back. And as it trickled down his sides and cheeks, Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman rubbed it into his hair and skin. Passers-by stopped to watch. Pretty soon, quite a crowd had gathered. Wilbur grew beautifully white and smooth. The morning sun shone through his pink ears. He isn't as big as that pig next door, remarked one bystander. But he's cleaner. That's what I like. So do I, said another man. He's humble, too, said a woman reading the sign on the web. Everybody who visited the pig pen had a good word to say about Wilbur. Everyone admired the web. And, of course, nobody noticed Charlotte. Suddenly, a voice was heard on the loudspeaker. Attention, please, it said. Will Mr. Homer Zuckerman bring his famous pig to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand? A special award will be made there in 20 minutes. Everyone is invited to attend. Crate your pig, please, Mr. Zuckerman, and report to the judge's booth promptly. For a moment after this announcement, the Arables and the Zuckermans were unable to speak or move. Then Avery picked up a handful of straw and threw it high in the air and gave a loud yell. The straw fluttered down like confetti into Fern's hair. Mr. Zuckerman hugged Mrs. Zuckerman. Mr. Arable kissed Mrs. Arable. Avery kissed Wilbur. Lurvy shook hands with everybody. Fern hugged her mother. Avery hugged Fern. Mrs. Arable hugged Mrs. Zuckerman. Up overhead... In the shadows of the ceiling, Charlotte crocheted unseen, crouched unseen, her front legs encircling her egg sac. Her heart was not beating very strongly as usual, and she felt weary and old, but she was sure at last that she had saved Wilbur's life, and she felt peaceful and contented. We have no time to lose, shouted Mr. Zuckerman. Lurvy! Help with the crate. Can I have some money? asked Fern. You wait, said Mrs. Arable. Can't you see everybody is busy? Put that empty buttermilk jar into the truck, commanded Mr. Arable. Avery grabbed the jar and rushed to the truck. Does my hair look all right? asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Looks fine, snapped Mr. Zuckerman, as he and Lurvy set the crate down in front of Wilbur. You didn't even look at my hair, said Mrs. Zuckerman. You're all right, Edith, said Mrs. Arable. Just keep calm. Templeton, asleep in the straw, heard the commotion and awoke. He didn't know exactly what was going on, but when he saw the men shoving Wilbur into the crate, he made up his mind to go along. He watched his chance, and when no one was looking, 
he crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw at the bottom. All ready, boys, cried Mr. Zuckerman. Let's go. He and Mr. Arable and Lurvy and Avery grabbed the crate and boosted it over the side of the pen and up into the truck. Fern jumped aboard and sat on top of the crate. She still had straw in her hair and looked very pretty and excited. Mr. Arable started the motor. Everyone climbed in, and off they drove to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand. As they passed the Ferris wheel, Fern gazed up at, at it and wished she were in the topmost car with Henry Fussy at her side. 